So I've been concerned a lot about the design community. So <clears throat> we train in traditional design schools exquisite craftsmanship. And the result is exquisite products, really beautiful products that are fun to look at, beautiful to touch and caress and hold, to have in your home, in your office, your workplace, your automobile. But these tend to be products. They stand alone, they work with you and it. And if you take a look at what modern designers are asked to do, quite often we go to design school and we spend four years learning how to draw and learning about materials and learning about construction methods and we learning the great craft skill. And we may even go on for another two years and get a master's degree and become an even better craftsperson. And then what are we asked to do? Oh, we may design a health system, or an educational system, or finance, or a transportation system. Does that training give us the right background to do this? No, it doesn't. Because you don't know anything about the world. You don't know anything about, it's amazing how many designers know so little about technology, or about people, yet in fact, what is design? It's the design is a system that takes technology and fills out human needs, so it's the bridge between technology and people. So you have to know all three topics, designing and people and technology, but it's even worse or even more complex if we talk about the social technological systems that we're encountering ever more in our lives like the Hong Kong transportation system, which is incredibly complex with many different varieties of transportation. I went to Soho yesterday, <clears throat> which meant that I went up the escalators, block after block after block after block. That must have been, you know, in concept, that's a very simple concept. We'll simply make moving stairs to take you up the hill. But it must have been incredibly complex to do because can you imagine basically destroying access to the stores all along that pathway. And if you look at it, you can see that different blocks had actually different technologies. They probably were built at different times because I wouldn't be surprised if the most difficult part of building that system was the political problems of getting it done. Because you have multiple stakeholders. You have the shopkeepers, and you have the city, and you have the people who are going to use it, and you have the people who are constructing it, and you have the problem of paying for it. We're dealing with more and more complex problems. I don't think designers are trained well. Now, many designers do brilliant work despite the lack of training. In fact, I sometimes think that great designers do great work because they don't know anything. And let me explain why. Because the great designer integrates together all these different disciplines. And that means you have to learn all these different disciplines quickly. And when you try to learn the different disciplines, you ask questions. And you often ask stupid questions. So when I was introduced, I, when you were told there is no such thing as a stupid question, and let me explain why. Because if somebody asks a stupid, I, I ask a stupid question of a physician, say, <clears throat> um, and everybody in the audience rolls their eyes and says, what a stupid question. What is a stupid question? It's actually one where, to the, to the people I'm asking it to, the answer is obvious. So I must be stupid if I don't know the obvious answer. But if I ask that stupid question and I get the answer, and then I say, why is that? It's amazing how many obvious things you do in your life where you actually don't know why. And when I ask the stupid question, it turns out to be the profound question that actually lets me make a breakthrough. It lets me say, oh, this is the way it's always been, but maybe it doesn't have to be that way, and maybe there's another way of doing it. So stupid questions are also the most brilliant. But there is a problem. Many times, stupid questions are, well, uh, stupid. They don't get you anywhere. So here's the trick. How do you ask the right stupid questions? 
So let me back up now about how we train designers. Because we train designers to be a craft. You are craftspeople, make beautiful, wonderful things. And I'm talking about these complex systems where the craft is irrelevant because we are doing different things. What happens that um, about a month ago, a bunch of us design educators were in Shanghai. We were all on the advisory board of Tongji University, which has a new college of design and innovation. And we have known each other for many years, and all of us have been concerned about design education. And the people with us included the dean of the School of Design at Delft, in the, uh, the Delft Institute of Technology, Delft University of Technology, uh, the former dean of design at Swinburne in uh, Australia, the dean of the Institute of Design in Chicago, uh, Case de Bone was there originally with us, but he left, he had to go back. But, so that's the dean of PolyU here in Hong Kong. And actually before that, he was a dean at Delft in the Netherlands. And me. And of course, the dean at uh, Tongji. And we said, you know, it's time for a different kind of education. An education that allows people to work on these complex systems. And we spent the next month writing a little manifesto, just a three-page little manifesto. And we decided <clears throat> we got to give it a name. And we didn't know what name to call it. We tried to figure out a name. And we ended up calling it X. So there's a manifesto that just got released to the world a day or two ago. This is the first public presentation. And it's called Design X where x is sort of like the algebraic variable that can stand for whatever you'd like it to stand for. So what is design x? Well, here's how we look at it. Here's a history of design that is inaccurate and rushed and simple, but it sort of captures the essence. Design started off in England with Wedgwood, China. It was called China because it was plateware that, you know, tableware that was copied from the Chinese, so it was called China. So Wedgwood China actually designed things for the middle class English people, the first time that stuff had been designed for middle class, not the upper class. And they made it an extremely successful business. And over the years, design became an important part of commerce and of business. And well-designed objects uh, did better, sold better. And then in the 1900s, this became sort of a major theme. So it didn't even matter how the objects worked as long as they looked like they were designed and attractive. Uh, for example, there was a big push towards streamlining. Airplanes were streamlined, and so pretty soon trains were streamlined, and cars were streamlined, and even pencil sharpeners were streamlined. It was sort of the design motif. In recent years, although the same kinds of craftsmanship has continued, more and more of our devices have computers in them or electronic circuits, and those are invisible. And so the way something works is not visible. We couldn't figure out how things worked because it was arbitrary. And so design then changed to try to understand how to make things that were understandable to people. And this is the basis of what is today called human-centered design, uh, of interaction design, of human-computer interaction or human-computer interfaces, which is to try to say, well, you know, it's up to the designer, not just to make it beautiful and wonderful, but also to make it understandable, to present a coherent conceptual model we can understand. And that's what design is today. But where is design going to be tomorrow? And I think more and more is going to move into the designing of things like medical systems or educational systems or transportation systems or what have you. And for this, the traditional craftsmanship, and even with a modern approach and emphasis on the human and the person and interaction, that isn't sufficient. So design X is an attempt to move to the next level. And I want to emphasize, we are not trying to replace the current craftsmanship or the current designers. 
we are saying that this is an additional, an additional skill. So we simply add it to the kinds of different designers we have, which is true of all fields. If you look at engineering, there isn't a single thing called engineering. If you say you're an engineer, it's meaningless, because I need to know what kind of an engineer. And even then, I need to know what is your specialty. You're a civil engineer, does that mean you build buildings? Or does that mean you build railroads? Or does that mean you do stress analysis? You're a computer scientist, what does that mean? That means you do theory? Or does that mean that you uh, do compilers? Well, the people who do compilers, they don't even understand what the theory people talk about, but they're both computer scientists. Well, design is, has to move this way too, to become a legitimate academic discipline where we learn, some people will learn the craft skills, some will be graphic or communication designers, some will be interaction designers, some will be product designers, but some may be system designers. So what do you need to do to become a system designer? And these are complex systems. I'm talking about systems that are, require understanding social structures, human behavior, economics, business models, culture, politics, zoning regulations, laws. The medical industry is an industry that is badly in need of assistance, and it has a huge number of regulatory issues that have to be overcome, which makes it actually very difficult even to design products because you have to pass through so many regulatory barriers. So what kind of education is going to be required? But more importantly, you know, there are lots of other people who do this already. So what is the role of the designer? Why can designers make a difference? And I think that's because of the special skills that we all learn as designers. And one of the important things that design is, it's a field of doing and of making, and we think by doing and making and drawing as opposed to engineers who think by mathematics, or as opposed to political scientists who think often with words. We think by actually making and trying and experimenting, and we focus upon the people. There are areas, there's a, there's a science called system science. There's another science that's newly developed that's called service science, which is an attempt to understand the science of delivering services, or the science of complex systems, but all of these neglect people. They neglect the very skills that designers have. And they don't think, as we do, by trying out things, by drawing and using space in two dimensions or three dimensions in our drawing and in our models. They think by words and tables and bullet charts and questionnaires and mathematics and some computer simulation, and the person is hardly there. These fields optimize. They want to make sure everything is as efficient as possible. But efficiency and functionality aren't the same. And efficiency and pleasure, not only for the people being served, but for the people who are doing the work, makes for a much better system. So designers actually bring this wonderful skill. Service design, for example, talks about blueprinting. Blueprint means what you do is you look to see the service that we're offering, and then beneath that, we say, what is, has to go on under the surface to make this work? Now, what's important and interesting about a service blueprint is that if I go to the bank and get a service done, I interact with a person. A lot of service design is, con is concerned about this interaction. But that person who works at the bank then turns around to all sorts of equipment and other people and interacts with that. So that person is a customer of the rest of the bank. And if you look at the rest of the bank, that's composed of lots of people and equipment who are also customers of the rest of it. And so what's really neat about service design is that if we design for the people, we design not only for the person doing the banking transaction, but we have to design for the people working at the bank. And that's a skill 
as far as I can tell, is restricted to designers. The whole point of human-centered design is to understand the people and to make sure we are dealing with the people. So, here's the challenge. How can we take the special talents that we have as designers of doing human-centered design, of going by starting by understanding the issue, by trying to observe and see what is going on, by never solving the problem that is given to us, because we are not problem solvers. I'm proud of that fact that we are not problem solvers. We are problem definers. When somebody gives me a problem to solve, when I'm hired as a consultant, I have a rule, which is do not solve the problem I'm asked to solve. Because it almost never is the real problem. The real problem is something else. And if you can get and figure out what the real problem is, quite often the problem you're asked to solve goes away. Well, those are the skills of the modern designer. And added to that, the fact that we understand about iteration and test and modification and continual modification. We can, we can look at complex issues and try to pull it apart. The kinds of problems that we will have to be dealing with starting today are what economists and designers have called wicked problems. And a wicked problem is one that doesn't even have a good definition. And there is, necessary, there is no solution. Wicked problems may not be solvable, but they can be improved upon. And that's something we're good at. Another comment, which is that if we deal with most of the fields that have a scientific background, they do very careful experiments, and they're very, they're very concerned with truth and the best possible answer and great efficiency. And let me tell you, I'm not interested in truth. I'm interested in good enough. I'm interested in the ability to take a complex medical system and make it better than it is today. And then when I'll come back next year or the year after, I'll try to make it better than it is then, and then better again, and keep making it better. But it doesn't have to be the perfect system. In fact, the perfect system may be impossible. It's what Herbert Simon once called satisficing. We want to make it satisfactory. And we only look for big phenomena. If you look at in the university, it's interesting. The university is, um, is actually one of the problems. The university educational system, it rewards people who are experts on deeper and deeper and narrower and narrower topics. And so we get the world's experts in some kind of metallurgy, or the world's experts in some kind of computational device, or the world's expert in some kind of human behavior. That's all very good, and it's useful to have. But you know, if we are designers, we're trying to make something that's really effective. And getting the world's best expert doesn't help us. Because what we have to do is put together everything. And one of the skills that we must have, therefore, is working across the domains and working with different stakeholders who have different ways of thinking and different beliefs about what is important. And we have to learn to work together, and the university does the opposite. It makes you narrow instead of broad. It makes you analyze what goes on instead of trying to create something that might change the world. And it teaches you to work all by yourself. If you work on your job and someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, you're supposed to ask somebody else for help. Or if your boss says, hey, I need a paper, you know, will you explain this new technique to me and you don't know what it is yourself, what you're supposed to do is not only ask people, but if you find someone who's written the good paper, copy it. Or take three or four good papers and copy the best parts and put them together. In the university, we're not allowed to do that, and therefore we have to lie and make believe we did it ourselves, and it's called cheating. In the workplace, it's called collaboration. So why doesn't the university insist on collaboration so that if I copy from somebody else, I say so, and I explain who I copied from, and my grade is based upon well, did I copy from the right people? Did I put together a coherent thing which came about from all of the different pieces? 
And actually, if I get a good grade, the person I copied from should get a slightly, could get part of that credit. University has other problems, because university is one of the problems I want to work on. It's one of those complex social technological problems I'm talking about, because we teach in the university in semesters. At Hong Kong Poly, it's 13 weeks. At my university, it's 10 weeks. At uh, other universities, it's 15 weeks. Why do we teach in those segments? It has nothing to do with learning or the knowledge. It has to do with scheduling the classroom. Well, let's, how, do, how do we solve that? And why is it that we go to a university and think that when we're finished, we now know everything we need to know for the rest of our lives? How do we solve that? Well, I think that's one of the kinds of problems that we need to solve. I'd like to get rid of departments in universities and replace them with problems so that we work on real problems and therefore we bring together all the kinds of expertise required to solve the problem. Because that's what we're going to do in Design X. Design X is going to handle huge problems that cannot be done by a single designer. It will require teams of designers and teams of experts and therefore the designers will have to understand a little bit about all of the different topics that come together so they know what experts to bring together, so they understand the language of the experts. They themselves will not be expert, but they have to be able to communicate. And they have to work in collaborative teams. And we should be training for this in the university. And we should be doing more of making and less of analyzing. Actually, my experience is that when I give this argument to university executives and administrators, they understand and they approve. Most deans like that idea. The enemy in the university is the professors. Because that's all the professors ever done. Most professors have never had a job in their whole life. Even, <laughs> even professors in business schools have never worked in business. And what they are promoted for is how expert they are in their narrow topic. And they think, therefore, that the topic they study is the most important thing in the world. Because otherwise, why would they study it? Which makes it really difficult to collaborate. It makes it really difficult to change the way we do things. But that's a design challenge. How do we manage? So, that's what Design X wishes to do. Design X wishes to take upon these challenges. It wishes to actually solve complex issues. It wishes to change the educational system to make designers more aware of all the different disciplines that must be better. And actually, not even just designers. I would like everybody to be able to understand how to put things together. The social sciences are essential, but the engineering is essential. The visual arts are essential. The business school is essential. We have to put these all together if we're going to make successful human systems. So that's sort of the main point I wanted to make, but I, do, I want to give you a little bit of what I'm doing right now because it's kind of interesting. I taught at the University of California, San Diego for a long time, 30 years, and I retired. In 1993, I retired. And after retirement, well, I became a vice president at Apple. And then I went on and became an executive at HP. And then I went on and started my own company with Jacob Nielsen, the Nielsen Norman Company. And then one of my clients hired me, and I went to Chicago in a startup, an uh, educational startup, where we went through a tremendous amount of money and collapsed. And so then I went to Northwestern University, now in computer science, but I started at the Siegel Design Institute there. And then I retired again. So I retired twice, and I failed retirement twice. So I went back to my home in Palo Alto, California, and was living happily, traveling all around the world, far too busy, came to Hong Kong a couple times, on lots of boards, enjoying life. Uh, and then the head of the University of California, San Diego, came to my home in Palo Alto and asked me to please come back and start a design program in San Diego. There was no design in San Diego. There's hardly any designers in the entire San Diego area, which is uh, from the Mexican border all the way to Los Angeles. There's almost no design. 
why would I want to do this? Well, because he, he gave me instructions of what he wanted me to do, and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. Here are his instructions. I don't care what you do, but it has to do two things. It has to be important, and it has to be exciting. That's it. Here's $3 million, go off as a starting point, uh, and make it important and exciting. Oh, well, gee. So I've actually been back now for about five months, and I've been spending my time making it exciting. I can do that. Making it important, that's hard. And so Design X is that first step of the kinds of things we want to work on. Because we don't see any need for another great design school. There's here, there's PolyU, there's Delft, there's the Institute of Design. There are lots of good design schools. We don't need to be one. There are lots of them. We need to be different. Design X is the way we want to move. Now, what kind of problems might we work on? Well, here's what's already we're thinking of. We are actually experts at what we call distributed cognition, where you have different entities all working together to do some system. And the entities might be people or groups or organizations or political bodies or machines. Some machines that are dumb, some machines that are smart, some machines that are completely automatic. And how can we make them work smoothly? Take a look at the automobile. The modern automobile can do 80 to 90 percent of the driving all by itself. And that modern automobile will soon be talking to all the other automobiles. So in fact, you don't even need traffic lights anymore because as the two cars come to the intersection, they'll just talk to each other and this car will say, okay, I'll slow down, and the other car will say, I'll speed up, and then they just go whizzing through. Cars already keep you in your own lane. Cars already can park themselves. Cars already can keep a safe distance in the car in front of you. Cars already can brake when there's a possible accident. Cars can already, the commercial cars can drive 30 or 40 minutes without any hands on. No feet, no hands by itself. And um, experimental cars can drive for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles, a million kilometers, with no driver. But we also know that these things are really dangerous because they don't work perfectly yet. And so today we're saying, oh, we must have a human there to take over when something goes wrong. And we know from aviation this will not work. So how can we make this complex system with cars that are getting more and more automatic that are talking to themselves, talking to each other, the driver is talking to the car, in fact, if you want to change your lane, it used to be you'd use a turn signal to tell the other cars. No, today you use a turn signal to tell your car that you intend to change the lane. So it decides whether it's safe to do so. Is there a car in the blind spot or not? That's a complex system. And the automobile manufacturers are very concerned about this. And that's one of the ones we want to work on. Or take Ebola. We were asked to work on Ebola. I don't know anything about Ebola, but it's a complex medical, political, logistic design problem. Um, the suits that you wear to protect yourself against Ebola, we got one. We put them on, they are three layers, two pairs of gloves. It takes 15 minutes to put it on. And we sat in our air-conditioned conference room doing nothing but talking and after 15 minutes, we wanted to get out of it. It was hot, we were sweating, and we were uncomfortable. And now imagine you're in Liberia, where the temperature is 30 to 40 degrees, and 100% humidity, and the patients are uncomfortable and screaming and running around and difficult. So here's the question. After you've done this for eight hours, and you're hot and sired and sweaty, you can barely function, how do you take off the suit can you imagine taking off your clothes without ever letting the outside of the clothes touch your skin? People who designed the suits didn't think of that because it was designed for different kinds of diseases or that wasn't the issue. So we want to do human-centered design and what's going on in Ebola places, but it's too dangerous to go and do it. 
So the only kind of design problems I want to work on are ones that give us a general principle that we can learn to apply to others. Design has this problem. Designers do this, and then they do this, and then they do this. Listen to design speeches. Here's a picture of what I did, and here's a picture of what I did, and I did this, and I did that. What do you learn from it? Nothing. I want to do design problems where we learn principles that we can give to others. So here's the principle. Here's the question. How do we do human-centered design when you can't go and watch? Well, we have some answers. So let me just give you another example, which is in the medical domain, in part because San Diego is one of their great um, resources, is medicine and biology, is graceful aging. Another one is individual medication. We're going to have personalized medication because of all the sensors and all the information we have about people's genetic makeup, about the sensors that you wear, like the Fitbit that tells you uh, your pulse and a few other things, but we'll have lots of other sensors. We're going to have a huge amount of information about the people. How do we make it so we can actually put that together? so we can give effective medication. Let me just close with one interesting observation. As we make more and more automated devices, it's de-skilling people and making problems worse. But there's another way. We should not be automating what we can automate. We should be trying to make teams. Teams of people and teams of equipment and teams of people and equipment. Let me give you a simple example. What's the best chess player in the world? And you might have several answers. You might list a person who's the best chess player, or you might list Deep Blue, the IBM's computer program that can beat any person. The answer is neither of them are the best chess player in the world. The best chess player in the world is a team of people, two or three people who have two or three computer programs. The two or three people are not the best chess players in the world. Some of them are not even international grandmasters. They're simply good, but not world famous, not world class. And the chess programs are not the world's best or the kind that you can go out and buy for your PC. And the combination of these people have beat every other chess player in the world. They beat other teams but they can beat the best human individual and they can beat the best machine because they know how to put it together. So one of the challenges for our future, as automation takes over more and more of your jobs, how do we change it so that automation is not replacing us, but automation is another team member which allows us to do better than we ever could have done before but needs, but where our talents are even more required, not less. So those are the challenges for the future, and those are the challenges for Design X. And I see I've, simply, I've now failed at a challenge I gave to myself, which is that I will give a short talk and leave lots of room for questions. But thank you.